OZI Configuration Management Working Group and also uh, the chair of APTA's Systems Engineering Subcommittee. So he sits in leadership positions everywhere. He uh, currently works with Hatch and he joined in 2019 as the director for Systems Engineering. He bringing 37 plus years of experience uh, in the transit and rail industries. He's a licensed professional engineer with extensive R&D design management and business development experience. Um, he's traveled all over the globe and he has a uh, specific experience and expertise in digital electronic design, software development, and embedded control of specialty equipment, mining, heavy construction, military rail vehicles throughout the US, Canada, South America, and Europe. So uh, we are in good hands with him today. He knows what he's talking about. And I will turn it over to uh, Dale to actually uh, go through our agenda and open up the program for us. Dale, take it away. Thanks very much for your kind words, Nicole. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is a little bit on the softer side of systems engineering. Um, it's the stuff that, for, for those of us on the call that classify us ourselves happily as nerds, uh, we probably aren't aren't as good at it um, or, or, or really as experienced at, but this is really important. Um, and uh, it, it is covered in the systems engineering handbook and even mentioned in 15288 a little bit. So uh, we wanna talk a little bit about terminology. Uh, Carlos is gonna talk about terminology and system complexity. Um, and uh, he'll be picking up the uh, conversation right after this agenda slide. Uh, we're going to also talk a little bit about large project organizations, and uh, we're going to posit that there's four sort of primary organizational peers that you should consider if you're intentionally designing uh, an organization for a large project. Um, and we're going to actually suggest that we really should be designing the organization, not just throwing it together based on some kind of loose teaming agreement or some joint venture agreement that the organization shouldn't just come together as an ad hoc or primarily politically motivated uh, positioning of people and roles. And, uh, and then uh, Bridget's, Bridget and Hannah are gonna take over uh, the last segment where we're gonna talk more specifically about uh, organizational change management and the design of organizations, stakeholder engagement, uh, changes and communications. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over back over to Nicole. All right, and I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker, Carlos Ortega, uh, also with Hatch. Mr. Ortega studied engineering at Florida International University and obtained his bachelor's of science degree in industrial engineering and technology. Uh, in 1996, he took a position at Miami-Dade Transit as a paratransit support specialist. And it was there that he progressed to Senior Operating Systems Programmer, uh, a position he actually held for 18 years, during which time he developed uh, his true passion for transit. Uh, from 2012 to 2020, Mr. Ortega worked for the Metropolitan Ramp Rapid Transit Authority in Atlanta, Georgia, where he started as a communications engineer and moved through the ranks to hold uh, the Director of Systems Engineering position. Mr. Ortega joined Hatch in 2021 as Systems Integration Manager. He has over 30 years of experience in engineering and project management, 25 years of experience in systems engineering specifically, train control, traction power, computer operations, network management, programming, transit, and government. Uh, Mr. Ortega is a member of both APTA and INCOSI, and we are delighted to have him uh, to talk us through some of uh, the complexities of transit systems and some of the terminologies that are used. Thank you very much, Nicole. Welcome, everyone. Um, can you hear me right? Yes. Wonderful. Well, so uh, in this section, um, I want to uh, touch on uh, understanding what the word systems uh, uh, means, uh, the terminology, uh, and how uh, we utilize it to minimize conf uh, confusion. Uh, and I also want you to reconsider um, the complexity uh, that uh, it's involved in modern rail system, all this within a large infra infrastructure and transportation projects. May I have the next slide, please? So uh, let me start by saying that words matter. Uh, the word system is problematic in our industry 
uh, practitioners often use it colloquially as a contraction for subsystems, meaning things like HVAC, electrical, IT, com, strain control, et cetera. Very commonly used, but it's an ambiguous uh, uh, word and it's confusing. Um, so uh, let me define um, systems engineering, which is an interdisciplinary field of engineering uh, an engineer manager management that focuses on how to design, integrate, and manage complex systems over their life cycles. So if we look at a typical transit system or transit system of interest, uh, we have many different components, as you can see here uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, you have your fixed civil assets, fixed electronic and mechanical assets, rolling stock, data warehousing, and digital assets. May I have the next slide, please? So um, system versus soft system, it depends on where you stand. It is relative to perspective. Uh, if we look at the um, uh, square, the white square in the middle, um, and, and uh, that's a city transportation system where all, all their systems like bus, rail, uh, mobility, uh, people mover, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that becomes a subsystem to the uh, uh, bigger uh, regional transportation system, which in turn is a subsystem uh, to the state transportation system. And all these combine are subsystems to the national transportation system. May I have the next slide, please? So this slide is uh, uh, more of an eye chart. I don't expect you to, to read everything here. Uh, uh, but uh, basically wanted to show um, five levels of uh, um, system hierarchy, uh, how we decompose it, you know, going, going down from all the way from the national transportation system to specific components within a rail vehicle, for example. So there are different, uh, um, depending on, on, on your perspective, where you are, uh, you may want functional views, uh, which are preferred, you know, for ramps and software development. Uh, asset management, like uh, 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 they prefer physical uh, breakdown, like uh, bill of materials. So if we focus on uh, a section here on, on, on the chart. Uh, we zoom in. Um, let me have the next slide, please. We're looking here on the left at the rail vehicle train operate, operator display, right? And, and it can have uh, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, 35 uh, primary function. These are all apps running within that display or making the, you know, the display run. And uh, they interface within each other. And, and they can have uh, uh, involve more than uh, 400,000 lines of code just in that particular um, subsystem of a rail vehicle. Uh, vehicle controllers uh, have many millions of lines of code. In the automotive industry, it's not uh, rare, you know, to see 100 mi uh, plus million uh, uh, lines of code. Uh, the more complex a system gate, the more stakeholders uh, you need to consider. There are many more interfaces to consider. And if we take this example and, and then apply it to train control, PLC, SCADA, and back, back office systems, the probability of integration errors increases greatly. Uh, as an example, um, I want to show you this uh, here on the, on the right bottom where, you know, back in the 1960s, uh, when we're talking about uh, a mechanical system, um, uh, we're talking about a 10 to the third interfaces. When we started introducing software as a means of control uh, back in 1980 and 1990, the interfaces grew to 10 to the fifth. On a, on a complex system today, we have over 10 to the six interfaces. May I have the next slide, please? So just to um, have a, a quick summary here, uh, words matter, like I said, uh, um, always try, uh, seek to minimize uh, confusion by explaining uh, uh, what you mean. Systems or subsystems, it depends on your perspective. Like we saw with the city, uh, the um, regional, state and na national uh, uh, transportation systems. Decompose the system, consider the view each stakeholder prefers, for example, functional, uh, for software development, for example, and the physical, 
uh, and etc. And please reconsider modern rail systems complexity. Rail transportation projects are often software projects based on complexity and of course that brings risk into the into the plate. So now let's talk about uh, project execution themes. And for that, I wanna bring back um, Dale. Hey, thanks, Carlos. Um, great, great summary of, uh, of where we're at with complex uh, transit rail or, or really any infrastructure project, uh, although we're focusing on transit and rail. Um, so what we're gonna talk about here um, is, you know, we've sort of set the table with Carlos talking about the technology complexity, and now we're gonna add some additional complexities into that, like the project organization and, and the integration and information management. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, not an unfamiliar diagram. I think folks have seen this maybe before, but uh, it's you know typical roles that you'll find in a transit agency. Um, a lot of them get sort of overlooked or siloed. Um, you know, sometimes we don't talk to the station agents as much as we should. Sometimes we don't talk to the O&M guys. Um, you know, FTA, D DOT, uh, whatever your oversight committee uh, group is in your state or country, um, you know, they sometimes sadly are only brought in when absolutely, you know, the regulatory compliance says they must be brought in. So they should probably be more of a partner uh, in a consistent fashion. But anyway, there's a lot of stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is kind of uh, just a sort of a 50,000 foot view of sort of understanding people. I mean, one of the most complex um, bits of the system of systems known as a transit system is people. People are really complex. Um, uh, we're all still trying to figure each other out. Uh, there are some sort of uh, behavioral models that have been created. Um, the the Q crave response reward cycle, uh, otherwise known as see like want get, that that's fairly uh, well you know documented. And and uh, PMI I think have some very good material on this, and we're hoping to to bring them into this conversation, possibly even f well there's not enough time between now and IW, but uh, you know in the next few months anyway. Um, but just like people, uh, since organizations really are, uh, you know, people are a big chunk of it, uh, organizations can become addicted too. you know, they statistically around 21 repetitions to form a habit. Um, so you can get that way with an organization and you can get that way with a multi year project organization. So that's, that's something to think about. The example here is sort of the case study was a company, you know, they've been in business for 50 or maybe even 100 years, but they're, they're in such a, a, uh, cycle of repetition and, and don't want to change. And, and this is going to be discussed more by Bridget and her team. Um, if they can't, if they can't change and they can't progress, then they might go out of business um, is a general concept there. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, human behavior, motivation, what motivates people? There's the classic, uh, um, you know, the boss trying to motivate Alice and she reminds them that all the nice stuff that you can do, you know, posters, whatever, is great, but really the government, when it comes right down to it, the government makes little rectangular pieces of paper uh, and depending what country you're in, uh, where I'm at, they're sort of green in color. Uh, so that's usually a good motivation, but there's other sort of uh, motivations that that really drive folks and drive their, their responses. And sometimes it's referred to as the reward structure. So a manager would typically be rewarded for and this is again, we're sticking to that train train display design that Carlos first talked about. They might be really rewarded for cost and schedule when it gets right down to it at the end of the day. Uh, I'm sure they would like excellent ergonomic design, but they're not really being rewarded for it. So they're probably not gonna promote it. Uh, the operations and maintenance, you know, they're looking for they're looking for that ergonomic design, I, you know, to try to avoid maybe driver union uh, difficulties. QA are trying to balance the tension between those competing priorities. And, uh, and so is the technical lead. You know, they're hopefully facilitating trade-off discussions uh, and mitigating risk uh, and taking into consideration Scott cost and schedule. Um, so it, it, there is some healthy tension that occurs between these various roles. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if you take all those roles and all those different people's viewpoints, and then you multiply in a whole bunch of processes um, and some of these processes are enabled 
for some roles more than others, but you can see a number of them here. You can see the project enabling class um, versus technical management versus uh, acquisition and supply. And then, you know, the classic, the ones that we tend to focus on a lot um, at Incozy, which of course are the technical processes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and just like uh, Carlos was showing, you know, the uh, the context diagram for for how the you know the technical product um, is is contained within uh, a greater and greater uh, envelopes. Technical processes, as an example, they're facilitated with technical management. Technical management occurs if you've got project enabling or organizational enabling things to make it happen. Um, and at the top of the, the you know the the agreement processes and the organization, which we're going to get into next, are are really what make projects happen. Um, if QA, program management or configuration management are missing or weak, um, the result will be non-supported or poorly supported technical processes that will probably eventually fail. Human nature being what it is. Uh, next slide, please. So now if you take all of the, all of that previous information and uh, kind of extrapolate it out into a typical project, you might have uh, where the acquirer is a transit agency, uh, you could have you know quite a number of suppliers. We've just shown two on this slide and there'll be subs to those suppliers. Uh, some of those suppliers will be you know engineering type consultancies. Some of them will be actually supplying maybe a train control system as an example, or, or switch gear or, or rail or civil civil works. And then there's external oversight. So betwixt and between all these organizations, which are already complex in and of themselves, you're trying to get the agreement, uh, information going back and forth, goods, services, all that data flow is, is hopefully uh, <laughs> transmitting back and forth. And the hypothesis or the posit, I guess, is that systems, typically fail at technical interfaces that's fairly well understood and we're extra we're extending that out to say that projects often fail at organizational interfaces so even if the technology is good if the organizational interfaces aren't working and that can be also internal so you might have a very large multinational company with divisions and offices in four different areas of the planet um, those are also organizational in interfaces that the acquirer might not even see or be aware of until it's too late. Uh, next slide, please. So putting all that together, large project organizations are a very complex system of systems. You know, a typical joint venture scenario, um, there's, there's going to be uh, a huge number of primes. An example we, we provided here was there's three primes, five main subs, there could be 60 other suppliers. And if you don't have that information uh, under control or even the, the uh, jet, you know, the priorities, the decision-making priorities under control, then there are gonna be a lot of collisions and a lot of uh, difficulties because, you know, that's, that's just what's gonna happen in an infrastructure contract. Um, is largely document based in a lot of countries, um, not everywhere. It's becoming more and more uh, data based, but uh, at least in North America, a lot of that stuff is still document based and that just makes it even harder. Uh, it makes it more of a challenge for information management. So some of the common process integration issues uh, that, that have been observed on large programs uh, is the difference between a source document and something that's published and approved for use. Often you find that it's a bit sloppy and those are used interchangeably. So people are transmitting Word documents around as opposed to a locked and published PDF. Um, that can be dangerous because you can get into a configuration nightmare, uh, which leads to the next slide uh, or the next bullet, sorry. Um, that, con that configuration management are often assumed to be operating because all companies, of course, must do it, right? Um, or they, they wouldn't be able to function. But that assumption can be dangerous because they may not be operating very well. Uh, often document control is really reduced to file sharing via SharePoint. Um, not so much thumb drives these days because everybody's working remotely, but uh, it could be a, you know, a cloud-based uh, version of that. Um, and that's not really document control. And if you talk to Microsoft engineers, um, which I have, uh, that SharePoint was never intended to be a document control system. You can bend it to, to do those sorts of things, but 
uh, that's some that's a consideration that that needs to be you know seriously taken into account. Review and approval processes sometimes have very little QA oversight. So depending on your the the QA or the quality management um, culture in your organization, you know you may or may not have uh, sort of continuous improvement happening. So are you getting the right people to the review meetings? Are the comments um, satisfactory are they at are they you know at a level of professional um uh, you know diction that that you would expect if you're paying somebody to you know to really have a a, a good look at all the documents that are going back and forth uh roles and authorities get really fuzzy especially amongst partners um accountability is often intentionally kept vague and i know that sounds cynical but that's just been in my experience, because humans, you know, as we said earlier, respond to their reward structures. Um, and that the sort of the culmination of all that is sometimes information management becomes just an ad hoc uh, situation. Um, so really, the bottom line is creating a large project team really is a project, uh, or it should be treated a little bit more like that. And it's it's because you're effectively creating a new company. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a uh, sort of an over the wall uh, diagram where you know you've got the contract awarded to multiple engineering firms and some of those firms you might might have a specialty company for civil engineering and architecture there might be a very special company or a part of a special company that are you know very good at tunnel uh, work then you've usually got the electrical and signaling folks and they may be separate uh, groups or separate groups within a certain company and the tendency is to take the contract documents the binders and split them all up and you know you guys do this chunk you guys do that chunk but you can lose uh the bigger picture uh, obviously when when you do that so that's something to be guarded against that's that's a classic approach that i've seen used that's fading fortunately and part of it's fading because of the work that the apta se subcommittee has been doing and in cozy so that's nice to see that that's not happening as much anymore uh, next slide please so summary thoughts people and organizations are complex. Uh, each role has a viewpoint. As Carlos mentioned, people respond to how they're rewarded. That's just human nature. Um, large project organizations are a very complex system of systems. Uh, you know, you can, and they can also form habits because, like people, um, you know, organizations can become addicted to not changing. Um, systems fail at technical interfaces, projects often fail at organizational interfaces. Um, there's a lot of disparate organizations that, that go to putting together an infrastructure project execution team and creating that large team is really a serious effort and it, uh, it really is like you're creating a new company. Uh, next slide. So real quick here, we're going to just put out, this is food for thought. Uh, it may or may not be controversial depending on your, uh, the culture that, that you're receiving this from. Um, but it's, we're, we're going to try to show maybe a better way to, uh, to balance out the uh, tensions that we mentioned between you know, the various viewpoints in an organization. Uh, next slide, please. So traditionally, um, you know, you've got to satisfy uh, whatever your federal or international best practices and standards are. And those, you can kind of clump those together. Those are policies and laws. And if you're, if you're the transit agency, you've got your policies um, that, that would be on top of that. And you've got goals and things that you want to achieve. So there's sort of four clusters of those stakeholders that we showed in that stakeholder diagram. You've got the financial and legal, you've got the project management viewpoint, you've got the engineering viewpoint, and quality management viewpoint. Um, and that makes sense because every country has regulations and policy for all those bulleted items, acquisition, uh, reliability of public transportation, safety and security, certainly. Um, and if you fail to meet those primary requirements, you can get a very public uh, you know, failure of your project. Next slide. So if you take those notional four clusters of stakeholder viewpoints, um, you would see that, you know, but ideally they would all be peers because they would all have the same level of accountability, which is why there's no arrows showing accountable in this particular picture. They all have, you know, responsibility, consultation, and information transfer between each other if they're truly peers. Um, so that's that's just kind of trying to show the racy uh, matrix uh, in a rough way. Next uh, slide, please. 
So conflict resolution, you know, typically you've got a discipline lead, a discipline supervisor, and so on. You, you, you sort of go up the chain of command uh, sometimes to, to resolve conflicts. Um, ideally, you're doing this to, to keep the team feeling like they're all part of one team and all working harmoniously together. You try to do that at, at as low a level as possible. If you're always um, escalating, then that's probably a very, con you're in a confrontational mode. And as we mentioned before, QA is a viewpoint, uh, PMO is a viewpoint, engineering is looking for its viewpoint of, you know, why did why did you become an engineer kind of thing? And finance and legal have, you know, they, they have their viewpoints, reduce spending, mitigate risk. Um, so a balance is needed. And, you know, you really can't overstate that if those groups aren't co-equal in authority, you could actually build in a conflict of interest that, that tends to tip towards only schedule and budget or only finance. And I've seen that happen uh, on projects where it's all kind of down to the, to the dollars and, and some things you know, aren't, aren't maybe taken care of as, as much as they should. Uh, next slide. So this is a you know, view of some traditional, um, uh, we call them suboptimal because we think it's building in a, a uh, conflict where PM is kind of in a position where they're making technical decisions sometimes and even sometimes overriding quality decisions. Um, and there's another version of that where everybody is only sort of bending to the will of legal or financial and that can also cause some tensions that that uh, aren't aren't optimal. Um, and uh, uh, we'll go to the next slide. We'll just try to won't be aware of the time. So here's here's the concept that we're we're putting forward as a discussion point, and we're actually going to have a, a workout, a break, uh, sort of a working session on that on this next week at the Encozy International Workshop, and we're going to try to keep pushing this forward. And we're looking for the Project Management Institute, PMI, to kind of give us their thoughts on this because they've really studied this stuff a lot. Uh, so the idea is, and we don't have all the arrows shown because it would just get too messy, is that you've got those four peers, um, you've got some independence for safety and security uh, and quality, and the technical uh, lead is leading the technical team. Uh, QA has, has some oversight on that. Project management, it's not shown in this diagram, is obviously supplying uh, time and money and the legal is providing their uh, risk mitigation oversight and also they're, they're providing the money. Uh, next slide. So the, the summary of all this is that, that you know, just like technology, um, pro organizations are, are complex. Uh, processes can be complex, especially if you've got 15 organizations and they each have their own processes. And sometimes within each uh, large company, there's processes that are disparate and collide a little bit. So if you put those all together, you can get quite a complexity storm going. Um, and then that leads to really, I think what we see in the chaos report that comes out every year, there's a more recent version. It hasn't changed much though. I think they maybe sample some more projects. You know, 50,000 sample projects is a pretty good sample statistical uh, sample space. And uh, that's not a great number, you know, 39%. And of those only 17% delivered really what was needed. So you made you made the budget and the design specs in the, in the 40% roughly, but only half of that uh, really got to the point of the thing. Um, so that's just food for thought. Uh, we'll go to uh, Bridget's team now for the next section. Great. Um, like Liz mentioned, uh, we want to introduce now Bridget Bieto, who founded Luminor Consulting Group in 2007 to focus on the growing challenges related to systems engineering, organizational change management, and process transformation in the transportation industry. She's gathered experience in organizational change management, communications, business process transformation, systems engineering, systems integration, facilitation, and system selection and design. Bridget is the vice chair of the APTA Systems Engineering Subcommittee and also a member of our INCOSI Transportation Working Group. Bridget, over to you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please.
So I think this particular cartoon captures quite well the essence of what most business process transformation or systems engineering initiatives involve. We as the project team will come in, we create havoc and we change people's lives and then we leave. So to ensure the change is in a project, um, we want to make sure that we're introducing sustainable change in the long run. So it's the joint responsibility of the entire project team as well as the organization. Next slide, please. So this is the change curve, and this is the strategy of how you move people along accepting change. And I'd like to reiterate a comment that Dale made um, when he referenced that chaos report that only 39% of projects succeed. And one of the reasons being is that people do not move the whole way along this change curve. People may stop at the awareness or the general understanding phase, but unless you go all the way through to where they're adopting and actually owning those changes, then we can turn any system on, but whether it gets adopted or whether it gets used can be another story. And I think we've all been part of those projects. You can have a technical success and then you can still have an overall operational or business failure because it doesn't work through with the program. Next slide, please. So what I wanna talk about is how do we go about making change concrete? And I try to take a high level approach here but you know, there's three basic groups that we need to make sure that we are involving um, and we want to have that foundation of team effectiveness. So stakeholder engagement is going to be a critical piece of this. So we need to have prepared end users making sure that they are ready. We need to have the business ownership where the business is saying that this is what I want to achieve, the vision and the alignment. And we need to have the executive stakeholders and the leadership saying that this is important from a strategy with the organization so that everybody knows that on every level, everything is aligned. Um, and you can see if you have the stakeholder engagement, you have the communication effectiveness and you have the organizational work design, then your end result will be the high employee performance. Next slide, please. So what's different about change management during major projects? As was said earlier, we have major projects, we may have a project within a project or a department within a project, within a system. So we need to make sure that we're understanding that and the level of complexity is really what can become a challenge. Uh, we talked earlier, Carlos had mentioned the importance of defining accurately and showing people that your systems within systems. So we need to make sure people understand where this fits in their organization, in their day-to-day -day life and in their priorities. Uh, because we need to make sure that there, we don't have conflicts uh, on the level of documentation management, on the way, level of configuration management. So we need to make sure that all of the items here are clearly mapped out. People understand the relationships. They understand new performance criteria and how that fits in with their organizational structure. Next slide, please. So it's very interesting. I actually have two slides that address this particular topic. Um, many, many studies have been done and it's referencing that approximately 75% failure reasons occur between non-technical issues. Only 25% are technical reasons. And I think, you know, we have very, very talented engineers and technologists in our industry and are able to very clearly design and achieve those capabilities. So that's not the primary reason for failure. It's the people and process side of things. So the next slide will delineate that a little bit further. So this one here actually provides a very good breakdown and um, it may seem shocking, but I will say that I have done lessons learned studies on multiple major initiatives and these percentages line up within, you know, plus or minus 3% in the different categories for what we've personally done. You'll see that 52% uh, are related to people and 16% to process. So 78% are people and process related, whereas technology and knowledge assets, they're only a combined, you know, 12% um, going through that. So that's, that's a very interesting number. Um, you know, the biggest issues, as you can see, it's the people side of it. So how do we go about addressing this? In that next slide, um, what happens when it's managed poorly? Well, you're going to have four categories that are going to be impacted negatively. First are your employees. They're going to resist the change. And that's the primary reason for failures, uh, according to a fortune study of senior executives, that more than one half of their organization um, changes fail due to employee resistance. If the leaders aren't involved, then there's a, a lack of direction. People know, may not know where it sits in the overall hierarchy or the prioritization of their life. 
or the organization can't sustain that. So sometimes you need to have a restructuring, sometimes you need to have a change in roles and responsibilities or job skills. Or lastly, if you don't have the knowledge and capabilities uh, to transfer over, this can be another failure point. You can have an external team come in, make everything work, but if your team wasn't lockstep with the agency, then the agency won't have that knowledge asset. So the next slide will talk about what happens when it's managed well. Uh, the people are impacted, um, they're ready for the change, they're excited about it, the leaders are visible, they're out there as champions of the project, the organizational structure has been modified to the extent necessary to sustain that change, and the project team performs very well together. Ideally, you'll have agency and external representation hand in hand so that the amount of knowledge transfer at the end is minimized, but the uh, overall, you wanna minimize any confusion or surprises and have the overall adoption of whatever your program is hoping to achieve. So the next slide, I'd like to talk about um, the scale of the change. So not all projects, we, we talk about the major ones, but not all projects are gonna be a major life-changing initiative. So you know, on a scale of one to 10, what this highlights, there's more and more steps that you will do to cover a project um, or initiative that has different levels of change. So I want to keep in mind that we can go more and more in depth as needed, but you don't have to do that for something that may just be a high, a high level or minor change. So in the next slide, we talk about the levers for change. And it's important to think about these. All of these are important. And many people think about and talk about the ones on the left-hand side, but sometimes they get missed are those on the right-hand side, but we're talking about ensuring the governance and compliance. Have you changed your internal governance structure? Have you ensured that it's compliant with the standards in the industry? Do we have performance management systems and KPIs set up to handle this going forward? Are there appropriate incentives and rewards in place for people to adopt these? We don't wanna just have it be where there's consequences, we wanna have the positive side as well. And then how does this impact our overall hiring and selection process? So that leads into our stakeholders. And I wanted to repeat this slide, even though Dale did a great job of going over it, but we need to reiterate, there are so many stakeholder groups. And when we decompose a system, we need to make sure that we are identifying and addressing all of the different stakeholders within the system. Um, from an organizational perspective, you may have someone that is a, you know, has a peer and boss reporting relationship organizationally, but on a, on a project, it may be peer to peer, or someone may be making the decision. So it's, it's important to address those changes and make it clear for everybody involved with the, with the uh, stakeholders. The next slide, we talked about a lot of this, but the, I wanted to include the OCM and training roadmap. Here are the work streams. And um, you know we have a thorough and detailed approach for each of the different specific deliverables. But the item where we've put a box around in the center, the business readiness and the organizational work design. Sometimes these ones are overlooked and people don't necessarily have as much of the uh, practice that they're looking to go into. So I think it's important to make sure that um, we focus on these and that we develop work streams and that we also engage in this early. As you can see, if you're working on business readiness and the organizational design, you can't wait to the end of a project to try to go forward. We do have major elements for successful change. And you'll see on the top that it's very clear if you go through these steps, the outcome is change. But if you miss a step on any of the ones below, you can, it result, can result in either confusion, anxiety, having gradual change, frustration, false starts, or any combination thereof. So we need to make sure that we're going through the entirety, which is important to make sure we launch this from the beginning. So communication strategy and plan will really help to make sure that people are informed and ready and have a clear, consistent message. So we wanna make sure that we introduce the communication strategy. Um, we have to outline its importance, clarify the roles, and make sure there's a feedback vehicle. So the communication mandate may be to raise awareness, but it may also be to have people engaged on different levels. Next, we provided some high level components of a communication plan that's important that we address. I'm gonna go in and say that there's, on the next slide we have, there's a lot of different communication channels and it's important for us to understand which ones are gonna work best. Sometimes face-to-face -face with an immediate manager may be the most important. Um, and then there's different ones you need to not only identify which ones will work in your organizations, but which ones you want to avoid. For instance, the grapevine and coworkers, you wanna make sure if that is utilized, it's utilized in a positive impact. 
as opposed to it being considered negative. So I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah to cover the change agent strategy. I wanna just quickly introduce Hannah. Um, Hannah has experience as a senior business consultant at Luminor Consulting Group with enterprise asset management implementation, data analysis, financial forecasting, cost benefit analysis, and business process mapping. She also has project budgeting, pr business process evaluation, mapping, and workflow expertise. She studied finance and accounting at the University of Colorado with previous experience in banking and fixed income. And she is also a member of APTA Systems Engineering Subcommittee and a member of the Cozy Transportation Working Group. Welcome, Hannah, and go for it. Thanks, Nicole. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. So I'm going to discuss the organizational change management concept of a change agent, which is one of the most successful techniques for engaging end users. Um, the change agent network is responsible for facilitating communications and supporting the messaging throughout the initiative and after implementation, then reporting back to the OCM core team with this feedback from their teams. Um, so depending on the structure of the organization, a change agent may be a manager or a supervisor, um, but most importantly, they need to already be the main source of communication within that group. Um, designating a change agent and their communication to their respective groups needs to begin at the blueprint phase and occur throughout the initiative in order for it to, in order to successfully engage the end users. Um, so we really wanna start this in the beginning. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide outlines the role description for a change agent. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of the essential responsibilities and activities. So the change agent is the decentral change management messenger and local positive voice for the changes within their respective teams. So I think of this like a change cheerleader, they're bringing down the messages from the top and advocating for them within their teams. And the second one is they provide feedback to the project or central change management teams. So emphasizing that this is a two-way communication from the top down and the bottom up. If things aren't working at the lower level then the change agent is going to need to bring this feedback to the centralized change management team. Um, next, I want to highlight the skill profile. The key skills needed for the change agent are gonna be great communication and trusted relationships within their teams. This person's generally not gonna be brand new to their team, um, rather someone that's known and established within their role in the business unit. Um, an example of someone who should not or would, would not be a great change agent, they may be well established within their teams but are lacking the soft skills to communicate this big change and may come off as demanding, talking down to people, belittling, all of which will lead to end user pushback. So they really need to, to have this broad spectrum of skills. Um, finally, the change agent role will consume about 10% of their working time. So it's vital that this person have the availability and capacity to take on this additional responsibility. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it back to Dale for the closing remarks. Uh, thanks. Great job, Bridget and Hannah. Um, so yeah, some, some lessons learned. We're just going to go through these quickly because we want to leave a few minutes for a conversation and discussion. Um, and just also to remind you that we are hoping to make this a bit of a thread of discussion over the next few months for uh, upcoming meetings. We're trying to pull in some experts from PMI. Uh, there may be even some on this call, I don't know. Um, Hopefully you're not going to bushwhack us, <laughs> but uh, that would be fantastic because we are looking for that that added uh, expertise on on these softer skills of organizational design and management. Um, so, as Carlos started out with, you know, improving precision and communications, making sure that if you say that you're working on a on systems or a certain system or a subsystem, try to be as precise as you can. If you're talking about the Incozy version of systems engineering. You know, try to be precise in that regard too, so that people aren't confused. Uh, large project organizations are obviously complex, very complex, because they got a lot of different people, a lot of different agendas. Um, and as as uh, you know, Hannah and Bridget outlined, it, it's great if you can get some alignment on those agendas from the top down. And it doesn't happen by accident; it has to be intentional. 
uh, systems fail at interfaces, projects often fail at process and company interfaces. Uh, design and control the integration of processes across a complex set of boundaries. Uh, 17 or 20 companies working on a large infrastructure transit and rail project. Um, that is not a uh, that is that is not a trivial trivial task to get that information flowing back and forth between those companies, and a lot a lot of times, and we sort of didn't mention timing of this, and this will be part of our future discussion threads, is really how do you design the project for success, uh, sort of along the lines of, you know, NTP plus thirty. Um, if you take that as your stake in the sand, if you say, okay, well, at NTP plus 30, we're going to have all of our management plans ready to rock and roll. Well, how do you do that? You know, like if you, if you got 20 new companies that maybe haven't worked very much uh, with each other. So that needs to be maybe rethought a little bit. Um, and the other, you know, the beware, some of the partners, some of your partners are probably competitors in other projects, which is going to cause, you know, uh, naturally some protectionist behavior because everybody's trying to protect their own company. Um, do you have time to actually verify and validate that the processes are working before you're actually in, you know, NTP plus 60 kind of thing? Um, I'm going to keep harping on this until, until I'm told not to, but SharePoint is not a document control system. It's a fire sh file sharing app. You can sort of use it that way, but uh, really, really try to consider using a, a proper document control system. Uh, and don't assume QA is executing um, at the same level across the project partners. Everybody, most of the large companies have their ISO 9001 cert, depending on who the auditors were and how much it's enforced in, you know, internally in the company culture, uh, it may or may not be executing uh, enough. And then uh, last slide, I think it is the next one. Uh, yeah, these are just summary comments. I think I've touched on a lot of these, but uh, focus in on a few here. Setting up a large project is real time and money. So that really does need to be included in your planning. Um, the organization should be designed intentionally. We've already hit that. Uh, there's the concept that you've got these peers that are in tension with each other, financial, legal, engineering, PM, uh, QA, uh, independent safety and security assessors. Um, you know, there's some natural tension there, which is healthy because it generates conversations that need to happen, but you don't want it to be um, excessive tension that, that, you know, you've got a conflict of interest built in because of the way your organization is designed. And then the enabling process, last, last but not least, one of the big, one of the real big hitters, information management and configuration management are often just assumed to be running. You really need to know, you know, to have some confidence, um, some assurance that they're running. So you want to verify and validate those uh, across all the corporate threads uh, as, as much as you can prior to actually executing the project. And I believe that's it. We can open it up for questions. Uh, yeah, that's it. So and I got. think the best way to handle it is if you have a question, uh, use the ask a question uh, feature or raise your hand. Or you can also, if it's easier to do so, uh, use the chat feature to submit questions. I can I can monitor that as well. I know the, uh, the this this softer skill set topic of of organizational design is probably um, not as exciting and could even be somewhat controversial because a lot of decisions get made in these these joint venture agreements or these teaming agreements. Um, they're made for uh, different reasons. So, uh, it, you know, if anybody has any examples they want to share, um, if they would like to be included in this conversation going forward, um, this is sort of a straw man that, that we're raising here to see if there's interest, interest and to see if our our assumptions are, you know, approaching uh, validity here. Hi, Dale. It's um, it's, it's Derek here of Network Rail. Hi, Derek. The, um, yeah, thank you. For that. I'm really pleased to see the emphasis on the change management and non-technical softer side of things because we're seeing things from the civil engineering community and the you know complex big program management community 
that uh, recognition that need to really invest on the softer side, the behavioral, the collaboration, and kind of balance that with the investment on the hardwiring of good process and, and good information systems. So really enthused to see that in there. And if there's anything I can um, throw into sharing it from this, that side and that bit of it, um, I'm happy to, to chip in. Oh, yeah, thank you, Derek. I really appreciate that. I mean, we are hoping that this will become, uh, it's, it's planned to become one of the, the chapters or the section of the APTA systems integration um, or systems engineering and integration standard that we're trying right. to produce. So yeah. uh, that would be fantastic. And we're, we're gonna right. want a lot of peer review on that. So what we're thinking is the next practical uh, step to go forward with this thread of thought is to, to make sure that we really, uh, you know, exploit the INCOSI PMI alliance that, that was created a few years ago and start pulling them into the conversation. Kind of in a similar vein where, you know what, uh, this is more of a technical thing where we're going to try to pull in um, the ASHRAE, uh, the heating and ventilation and, and room quality experts when we have that discussion on topics like very specific technical topics like tunnel ventilation uh, we would want to pull in, you know, who are the experts on air quality and, and modeling of, of, you know, particle mm. density and airflow. In a similar vein, you know, for the PMI, they've been gathering data um, on project organizations and human, human behavior. And that's also why we're very excited to have Luminar helping us with this because, you know, they're experts on, on organizational behavior. So we can get enough of those kinds of folks in the, in the, uh, the virtual room. Yeah. Um, you know, we can maybe put some good practical stuff in our in our document. I think I applaud you. It's a really good move to integrate in the other institutes and other associations to produce a rounded piece. So yeah, I, good good work. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Dale. We have a, a question uh, posed by Mike in the chat. Uh, he says SharePoint and ShareFile and other readily available software is used for document control. What systems do you recommend? Ooh. <laughs> Well, in theory, during these um, these Incozy type sessions, we're not supposed to uh, do too much of that kind of branding, but there are uh, some pretty good, uh, if you just look up, um, you know, uh, document control systems, uh, I, I'm reticent, to, um, you know, Big, Big Blue <laughs> makes, makes one uh, that's quite, quite good. Um, and, and it actually ties into, uh, you know, the file sharing. So, I mean, there's no, no problem with, you know, using the file sharing techniques uh, or that the SharePoint give you as far as, you know, actual physical storage and backup and, uh, you know, access to the data. But the idea is that, you know, you really want to, you really want something that's going to build in, um, I can mention a few names, I guess. Uh, Bluebeam is one that we've had uh, some pretty good success with. I don't even know who makes it, so maybe it's okay to, to say their product brand. Hopefully, I won't get in trouble. Um, but you know, that's that's one example. So if you looked up competitors to Bluebeam, you would probably get quite a decent uh, array, and and you can go through uh, some of the. Uh, uh, there's some pretty good industry uh, quadrants on this. I'm I'm trying to think uh, who makes. Oh dear, I sorry. I apologize. My brain's a bit fuzzy. I've been ill for the last couple of days, so. Um, Gart Gardner, the Gardner, uh, if you look up the Gardner, uh, I think they call it the quadrant and they score, they, they take a score, you know, where you've got coordinates sort of, uh, Northeast, uh, Northwest, Southeast, Southwest kind of in a quadrant, um, they score products in, in various classes of, of information management. So that would be a good place to start. Um, I, hopefully I'm being helpful. My brain's not working. Sorry. <laughs> You can make, um, just as a final thought on that, you, you, you can make SharePoint pretty close to a document control system. You just have to um, consider, I mean, the thing that often gets forgot about is, is especially if you're trying to do continuous improvement, if you're trying to really go to like a CMMI level five company where you're really truly doing continuous process improvement, you're taking data, you know, you're gathering data from your review sessions on uh, the quality of the reviewer comments the quality of the response comments. Um, 
are people attending the reviews? Is the review material getting out early enough so that you can actually do a good quality review? Um, is that being communicated back and forth between the program management group? I mean, are they building that into their Gantt charts? Do they have sufficient float, you know, to do the two or three review iteration cycles that might be necessary? Often that's not the case. They just might not even include a, a, you know, maybe one review cycle. So all of those sorts of things need to be considered metadata that needs to be built into a really good document management system. I just want to bring attention to time. We are we have about uh, one minute remaining. Okay. Um, and, and just uh, remind everyone that our next meeting will take place on February 18th. And if you don't mm -hmm. have those uh, calendar holds, feel free to reach out to me or Dale or, or any of us uh, kind of on the admin side and we'll make sure that you get that on your calendar. Yeah. Thank you. D Dale, I just want to mention one thing. Um, you know, all of this very so topic is what we're actually uh, emphasizing in the, our input to the version five of the NCOSI handbook. That's true. So, this is very relevant. This is our key theme. This is the key theme. So it's, it's bringing that part of it into it. And uh, for this type of area, because it's organization-based and agency-based, it is it is the core, I think, in a lot of ways. Getting handle on the technical things, yes, very important. But if you don't have control of your own organization to help push it through, well, how can one succeed? <laughs> yeah, right, right on. I mean, how many times in, in a project or in the office back when we went to offices, um, have you heard somebody say, well, the technology is not that hard. The people are really tough, though. You know, so, yeah, that's that's a good point, Mike. Um, hey, Mike, uh, maybe announce the, who the speaker is for the next uh, just. Uh, oh, well, Derek. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right. just there. <laughs> Derek, yeah. yeah, Derek, we're, we're putting together. He just sent me uh, some more info and uh, so we can get the flyer but done. But uh I think, Derek, you've got a very good story to tell. And I think on the 18th, uh, it will be quite exciting, your experience in Network Rail and probably similar issues, as well as this overall framework for uh, system integration. So, yeah, w Derek, uh, we expect great things from you. <laughs> no pressure. I, I believe that Derek Price has dropped off. Oh, <laughs> he said he had to he's go. Left, the off <laughs> left the building. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, just, I guess, in a closing, uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. A lot of thanks to our friends at Apta for helping us get this organized and arranged, and also our, our good friends at Luminor, who really appreciate uh, your guys' contribution. We'll keep moving forward with this thread, and we hope to make it um, kind of a, a bit of a feature of a workshop event. So now I'm going to put in a shameless plug for the Encozy International Workshop which is coming up next, uh, starting next Friday for three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, we have a two hour slot. I think it's at uh, 20 hundred hours central European time. So I just have to, my brain's too fuzzy from cold medicine to do the math. <laughs> I think that's about 2, 2 p.m. Eastern. Okay, yeah, yeah that makes six sense. hour time difference. It's like six hours, right? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just want to give a shameless plug for that as well as our, our event next month. So anybody that's interested, uh, we'll try to continue this thread. And if you have if you have any thoughts on on this sort of softer systems engineering topic, please uh, email one of us, Nicole, myself, Bridget, uh, Carlos, Mike, uh, Allison, any anybody that's on the team here, and we'll we'll try to take it forward and include make sure you're included in the conversation. So so thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. See you all next Thank week. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Very good.